Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today we're talking about the curious cases of Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. The last couple of lectures introduced the nuclear club. And if you know a little bit about geopolitical nuclear history, you may have wondered why Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine did not appear on that list. What do I mean by that? Well, at the end of the Cold War, the Soviet Union split into a bunch of different countries. Four of them pertinent to our conversation were Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. That's because the entirety of the Soviet arsenal was in those four successor states. And indeed, in three of those cases, the stockpiles were substantial. This is a snapshot of the distribution of nuclear weapons at the end of the Cold War. You can see Russia had a ton, and the United States had quite a bit as well. Ukraine and Kazakhstan had substantial stockpiles, and Belarus had a handful. I've put France at the end of this chart, because among non-Soviet countries, and not the United States, France had the most nuclear weapons in the world. And so if you look at Ukraine and Kazakhstan, in fact, Ukraine and Kazakhstan had the third and fourth most nuclear weapons at the time of their birth. And despite that, we still don't count Ukraine and Kazakhstan as nuclear powers. And we don't count Belarus either. Why is that? Well, the key is that Russia had command and control of the missiles. So all of those weapons that were sitting in Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine were not controlled by the military or the politicians within those countries. It was always someone in Russia that had the ability to press the button to fire those weapons. And so absent the ability to use weapons, we don't count countries as nuclear powers. That's why Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine were not on the list. However, the presence of those missiles within those countries still created proliferation problems. And it's worth understanding how the international community worked towards solving that. There are two main agreements that governed what happened next. The first is the Lisbon Protocol, which arose right as the Cold War was ending. This made Russia the recognized successor state to the Soviet Union under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So you will remember that the Soviet Union was one of these states that was designated by the NPT to be allowed to have nuclear weapons as long as they were working in good faith toward disarmament. So Russia inherited that role. Meanwhile, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine were to enter the Non-Proliferation Treaty as non-weapons states. So the Lisbon Protocol laid out in principle what was supposed to happen. Actually executing these principles took a little bit of effort. The other major agreement was the Budapest Memorandum in 1994. This is what actually gave Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine the incentive to follow through on the agreement. Each of those countries received security assurances from the United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia, and this led to the dismantling of those weapons. The United States played an important role in the disarmament process. These are two senators, Sam Nunn and Richard Lugar. They co-authored and co-sponsored an important piece of U.S. legislation that created the funds available to execute the disarmament processes in Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. However, each of those states underwent a slightly different path toward disarmament. So let's go through them one at a time. Let's start with Belarus, because that's the easiest of the cases. Belarus was already reliant on Russian support. This included both military and energy needs. Moreover, the traditional path to invasion of Russia goes through Belarus. As a result, Russian promises to support Belarus in the event of an invasion were immediately credible. And as a result, disarmament of Belarus was relatively easy. Kazakhstan was more of a mixed bag. On one hand, it was the site of the Soviet nuclear tests. This left a physical mark on the landscape, but also a normative aversion within the country toward nuclear weapons. On the other hand, Kazakhstan has large uranium reserves in its ground. And at the time of its independence, it also had a huge stockpile of weapons-grade uranium. Moreover, Kazakhstan shares a border with China, and there were some natural security concerns there. 
All told, Kazakhstan had an easier route toward developing nuclear weapons and more of a security incentive to do so. Nevertheless, the interested parties came together to make sure that Kazakhstan would want to follow through with disarmament. This meant that the United States helped by purchasing stockpiles of uranium and offering millions of dollars in aid to Kazakhstan. Security assurances came in from China, but also from Russia and the United States. And with some of that highly enriched uranium, Kazakhstan received down-blended versions of it, which would not be suitable for weapons, but would be useful for electricity generation in a nuclear power plant. The toughest case was Ukraine. Even as the Cold War was ending, it was obvious that there was a potential for rivalry between Russia and Ukraine something that we've seen come to fruition in more recent years. Moreover, Ukraine had a larger economy than Kazakhstan or Belarus. Summing these together, Ukraine had a greater desire to build nuclear weapons, as well as a better ability to weather the storm that comes with trying to do so. Still, there's a solution to these problems. Give Ukraine more to convince them that disarmament is in their best interest. And that's exactly what happened. Ukraine received more security assurances, received more economic aid, and also received some of those benefits of down-blended uranium that were suitable for power plants, which was especially important for Ukraine as it wanted to really jumpstart its economy right at its birth, and having lots of cheap electricity would help out in doing that. So that takes care of Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. These countries ended up not having nuclear weapons, at least the way that we code them, because they never had command and control of those missiles. That always was within the hands of Russian military. Hope you enjoyed this, and hope to see you next time. Take care.